found somebody. And so we have, um, we have a plan, and our plan um, is to be able to, on Good Friday, uh, starting on Good Friday, we're going to not be having our Wednesday night service as we get closer, um, but we'll be having a Good Friday service here. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be an awesome time. We always have a great move of God on Good Friday. And then also um, we're going to be having our Easter Sunday here at 10 a.m., so, you know, it's going to be a very simple approach to Easter, you know. Um, we're not going to, uh, you know, be bringing in any kind of livestock or anything like that. Uh, someday, someday I'm going to come, come riding on a, on a colt. Come on, somebody. I'm gonna come. But this year we're going to, you know, do, what, do, what, do our strong point, what we're strong at. And we're, and we're strong in, 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 in some areas that we want to be able to uh, soul win for sure okay so next weekend we'll be giving you some homework to do uh, on, on Palm Sunday we have um, we have some flyers that you'll be taking with you and then you'll be inviting three people so we'll explain it all next week and then we have the week of uh, Passion Week as they call it we're going to be having Zooms every morning from Monday to Saturday okay because we're going to be on a, on, a, uh, on a fast for six days and then we're going to be uh, having a Zoom uh, prayer every morning. So everyone can get involved with that. We'll be giving you, again, more information. It's for everybody uh, to log on before you go to work or before you do what you do at 6 a.m. And uh, we'll definitely give you more info as we move close. But we're excited to win some souls. We're excited to see a harvest come in. We're excited to see what God is going to do on Easter Sunday. Song of Solomon chapter 2, and we're going to uh, read two verses that start in 14, and it says, O oh my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. I felt I needed to read that scripture today, but this is the one I really want to read to you, and the reason why I wanted to read that is because it shows the intimacy that is desired from Solomon. Verse 15 says, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Father, bless your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. I want to speak to you today for a few moments on open heaven hindrances. Open heaven hindrances, and we've been on open heaven, if you've been around for any time, uh, coming to the church for any time, you know, open heaven is, uh, is a common, common word we use around here, it's, you know, but it means something, and so as our church has experienced an open heaven, as we have been, you know, uh, in revival for a few years now, and we've been pursuing the presence of God like never before, and we've been relentless in our prayers, we've been relentless in our fasting, we've been relentless in just pursuing God, yeah, I hope and pray you were here a little earlier, and you were uh, a part of what was taking place earlier, as we were uh, in prayer, and then even in worship just a few minutes ago, that is just a little bit of what we do around here. And so in our pursuit of him, and in this, uh, in this, I don't want to call it a season because seasons come and go, uh, but in this time of an open heaven within our church, uh, we have to know that there's also going to be some hindrances that try to come our way to stop us uh, from achieving an open heaven or even a personal revival slash a corporate revival. I was uh, researching the other day and I came across this story that I found interesting, and it was a story of how Eskimos catch and kill wolves that are trying to come in and either, you know, uh, steal from them or take the cattle from them or, you know, come in any way and try to threat the community. So according to the story that I read, um, the way these Eskimos kill these wolves is that the Eskimo will take a, take a knife 
and they will coat the knife blade uh, with animal blood, and then they'll freeze it, and then they'll do it again, and then they'll freeze it, putting layer of animal blood and then freezing it layer upon layer upon layer. And what they end up doing is they conceal this, this layered frozen buck knife, if you will, large knife, and they put it in the ground. And as they put it in the ground, the wolf will then, as it begins to melt a little bit, the wolf will then, with his sensitive nose, begin to discover uh, the smell of the animal blood. And he'll be attracted to this blade that is melting little by little. And as this, um, as, as this wolf begins to lick, then lapping vigorously, the story says, uh, this blade, um, he begins to take layer of blood, layer of ice, layer of blood, layer of ice, and he begins to, you know, uh, eventually the Eskimo will wake up in the morning and find the wolf dead. And the story is, the moral of the story, is that the more the wolf craves the blood, what he does not notice is his own tongue getting numb. And he doesn't notice also the razor-sharp sting of the naked blade on his own tongue. Nor does he recognize the, the instant when his, when, his, when his own thirst is being satisfied by his own warm blood. So his, his carnivorous appetite continues to crave more until the morning light. Then the wolf again is found dead in the snow. That was an interesting story to me. Because, because I began to think about human nature. I began to think about you and I. And how, you know, uh, we can, and I say we because we all can fall back into our old behavior. We can all fall back into a blatant sinful life. Someone say, we all can. Because we, like the wolf, really don't notice it at first. But it's the little foxes, according to Solomon. For the same reason that the wolf begins licking the knife blade, it seems safe and delicious at first, but it really doesn't satisfy. So the more and more he desires is actually leading to a crisis in his own life, which eventually leads to his own death within his life. So don't be fooled is what I came to tell us here today by the temptations of sin, my brothers and sisters. Like the wolf, we can all get away with it for a while, but eventually, however, its true character will be revealed. Sin eventually leads to death and destruction. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through and only through Christ Jesus our Lord. Someone say it's the little things. It's the little things. Everyone focuses on the big things. Everyone focuses on the Super Bowl. Everyone focuses on the World Series. Everyone focuses on the big stuff. But today, the Lord told me to tell you, watch out for the little foxes in our life. Now, the Song of Solomon is really an interesting book to me. As I begin to study it and look and kind of unlayer it, um, uh, I found out that, you know, um, it is often used as what they call an allegory type of book. Now, an allegory type of book is, you know, a book that is a story that has symbolic, symbolic meaning that you and I could apply to our life or our everyday life. Uh, some scholars view this book as an extended type, with Solomon actually typifying Christ and the, and the beloved of, of the church. So it's like a relationship between Christ and the church. Some see it as a drama. Come on, somebody. A novella. Yeah, thank you. Many evangel evangel evangelical scholars interpret the Song of Songs as a poem are just one song of many songs, hence the name Song of Solomon. So, you know, regardless of where, you know, uh, we sit in our interpretation of the Song of Solomon, you know, whether we view it as a courtship, a wedding, or even maturing in your marriage, 
one thing is for sure, that it is a book about intimacy. It is a book about a relationship. It is a book about someone pursuing someone. It is a relationship of ups and downs. It is a relationship of chase and catch. It is a relationship as this is what my life looks like when I stop pursuing him. It is a, rela- it is, it is, it is a view of him pursuing the one he loves and then the one that he loves rejecting him but then later wanting him come on somebody and 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 this is this is an interesting thing to me because because as we victory outreach fremont are in our own pursuit for his intimacy for our own love relationship come on somebody we must we must understand that it sounds a lot to me like an open heaven and a lot like a revival pursuit to me. So anytime someone has a hunger and a desperation to get closer to God, that's revival. Someone say, that's revival. revival. See, but we need to rest assured that when God's people get revived, the church gets revived, and we begin to experience an open heaven, there is going to be some hindrances that come after us. That's why I say it's those little things. It's those little things. Take notice of the little things. Don't look away from the little things. In our opening scripture, in uh, Song of Solomon 2.15, you know, what stands out to me is it says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes. He goes on to say, they will ruin your vineyard. Our vineyard the vineyard that is in bloom, the thing that you've been working so hard for, the thing that now has fruit, the thing that you're starting to see, you know, grow. Uh, Your faith is a vine. Your walk with God is a vineyard. Your, come on somebody, your family getting saved. It may not look like it in the natural right now, but come on somebody. They are but moments, hours, months, seconds away from giving their heart to God. So don't, don't, don't let the little things, the little foxes come in and begin to take what you've been working so hard for. You ain't hearing me today. See, our vineyards that are in bloom, they might, they might, they might seem strange. Come on, somebody. Uh, they might seem a different way, but I'm here to tell you this morning that they are tender. The matter of of foxes arise in this portion of scripture. And whenever you see a fox inside of the Bible, they are, they are a symbol of destruction. Uh, um, Nehemiah, off the top of my head, was building the wall. And Sambalot and Tobiah and another guy came along and they said, uh, look at these, look at these feeble people trying to rebuild the wall, trying to get their family together, trying to build the church, trying to look at how, look at, it says, and then, and then Samuel and Tobias says, you know, they, you guys, you're, you're so naive to think that you could rebuild anything in your life. Come on, somebody. And he says, he says, you could try to build it. The enemy says you could try to build it, but all it's going to take is a little fox come and walk, walk along the top, and that whole wall will come down. See how the enemy tries to use the little foxes in our life. I believe it was Samson when he was in his hot mess. Tied 300 foxtails together. I didn't study that. I'm just downloading right now. But he had 300 foxtails that he tied all together. He put torches around them and threw them in the enemy's camp. Come on, somebody. Fought the enemy through destruction. So spiritually speaking, foxes refer to the potential problems that will come between, between and try and damage our relationship with God. They will try to come and damage our relationship with each other. We need to take preventive measure, I wrote down here this morning, to protect this love from anything that could harm it. It's the little foxes. I wanted to get that into your spirit here today. The Song of Solomon, what I discovered, is, is a wise and beautiful verse. The vineyard, again, it's in bloom. A 
again, the vineyard is winning. The vineyard looks good. The vineyard has fruit. Uh, things are getting better. Uh, there's a, there's a, a romance. Come on, somebody. Uh, alive, and it's growing, and I'm getting better, and I'm getting victory, and I'm winning now. Come on, somebody. I'm, you know, I'm getting there. I'm better, I'm better this year than I was last year. I'm better this week than I was last week. I may not have it all together. I may not have the words. I may not, you know, understand the whole picture right now. But I can tell you one thing. I'm not quitting. I'm going forward. And because I am, yeah, the enemy is going to try to come with those little foxes. Someone say little foxes. See, the foxes are the potential threats to our relationship. And we must remove them. The foxes are little the little things, the things sometimes that we overlook, the things that we ignore, the things that we kind of sweep under the carpet. We often, it's those little things that often spoil everything. And they devalue what we've been working so hard for. Ooh, Jesus. So here in the Song of Solomon, he's really just telling us today that we must be careful of the potential dangers in our relationship with him, relationship with, with others, and don't let these threats come into your life. So my charge for us here this morning is that we are great at spotting the little things. The little things. We must be great after today. Take notice of those little things within our lives. Though they are little, they do great mischief. Ooh, Jesus. Come on, somebody. I know it, I know it feels good now. I know it looks good now. I know it sounds good now. But watch out for those little things. Our vines are tender, I wrote down here. But they must be preserved. Or else, according to this scripture, our harvest will fail. Ooh, Jesus. So what foxes are we to be looking for is the, like I like to say, the million dollar question this morning. What foxes are we looking for? And this is what the Lord gave me. Uh, is number one, the foxes in our own lives. The foxes in our own lives. Say what? No, pastor, not me. Don't put me on the chopping block today. Don't put me on the altar. We just sang that song. You were all broken. No, oh, purify. I want to be close to you. I want to be tied by, by. Oh, do you realize what you're saying? But we be tricking you sometimes with these songs, huh? <laughs> I want to be tied. Okay, well, here's, 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 here's more for you then if you want to be tried is that we have to we have to watch the foxes in our own lives according to commentaries the scripture is talking about corruption in our own hearts what does corruption mean fraudulent and dishonest conduct oh i can't even look at you right now <laughs> yeah i can but it's it's all of us is the great thing is it's all of us you know, I stand here today watching out for, as I'm putting this message together, I'm like, oh, heck no, Lord. No, man. No, I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm doing pretty well. So I thought. Inside of my life, and the Lord says, no, you got some little foxes in there. Little sly foxes inside there. Yeah, watch out. Ooh, Jesus. What does Jeremiah say? Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says that the heart is deceitful deceitfully wicked above all things and it's beyond cure who can stand it jeremiah says he goes on to say i the lord search the heart and i examine the mind and i reward the man or woman according to their conduct according to what their deeds deserve so that scripture right there is enough to send anyone to the altar so what is what is what is this scripture telling us <laughs> oh it's telling us to stop being so shady Did I say that? Yeah, I did say it. Yeah, you got to stop being so shady. 
Ooh, Jesus, come on, somebody tell your neighbor, stop being, no, don't tell him. No, yeah, tell him. Stop being so shady, man. Yeah, we were in the men's home with a guy from A Street. His name was Shady. Hey, what's up, Shady? He kept that name too, right? He's a good guy. Yep. I didn't want to drop his name now. Come on, Louis. Yeah. Can you imagine that though? But you shouldn't be called that in, in God. Like, you shouldn't be called that in Christ. Like, if you're still calling yourself Shady in the Lord, then stop today. Like, come on, somebody. Get rid of that little fox out of your life. You are no longer shy girl. You are no longer shady. You are no longer whatever your name was in the world. Come on, somebody. Hey, get rid of that big fox out of your life. But stop being so shady, the Bible is telling us. See, you want to stop revival in your life? You want to stop an open heaven in your life? Come on, somebody, then stop. Keep on. Well, I don't know about my English here. In this. I said, then stop, then keep on being shady. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I might have got interrupted midway in that sentence there. But our own sinful appetites and our own passions, these little foxes, when they are left unnoticed, will crush any forward momentum in your life. They will crush good beginnings inside of your life. And this is why many people start good, but they don't end good. Many people come and they give their hearts to God week after week. Come on, somebody. We come and we're forgiven. We're pardoned from our sin. But yet still, we still kind of act shady all the time. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's because God is saying, get rid of you got little foxes in your life. you got little things inside of your life. It's time to get rid of those little foxes inside of our life because it's stopping you from going forward. See, the plan of the little foxes is to prevent any future fruit inside of your life. Solomon says this fruit is tender grapes. Some things seem so little, but later proved to be very, very dangerous. I hope you're hearing me today. So whatever is a hindrance today, you and I must put it away. We, got, we have to put it away. This is all of us. Someone say it's all of us. Yeah, pastor, you're just talking to me. Well, then so be it. Maybe if you feel that way, then you feel. But I'll, trust me. I had all of you in mind when we were putting this thing together. Joshua chapter 7 is the story of Achan. Most of us are familiar with that story. It's the story where Joshua was trying to take the children of Israel now in to occupy all of, all of the promised land. And God gave him a plan. And God told him, okay, there's going to be ten cities that are a part of Canaan. And so the first city that I want you to go in uh, the first out of ten, there's another principle of, 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 of the first fruit. But he says, I want you to go in there and I want you to, to destroy everything in that city. He says, with the exception of Rahab and her family. And then when you find any gold and any silver or any bronze or any of that, I want you to bring it because we're going to use that for the tabernacle at a later time. And so, you know, uh, as they go in and take the first city... You know, someone that had a little fox in his heart had, you know, a little plan of his own, and he didn't listen to the instructions. And Achan went in there and found some goods, and instead of turning them in, he kept some for himself. And he was shady. Come on, the first shady. Number one shady. And took it to his tent and hid it under, under his tent. Dug a hole and the whole kit and caboodle. And so... Everything's normal, everything's fine, so they thought. So Joshua goes on to take the next city. And as he goes to take the next city, this one was supposed to be a sure win, the second city. AI was supposed to be, you know, we're not even sending all the troops in. We're just only going to send this amount of people. You know, uh, God has given us the victory, you know. Uh, and sure enough, as they go in to take the second city, Israel gets chased out of their own hood. Come on, somebody. Gets chased out of their own promised land. And they come back and they start, you know, brainstorming what went wrong. Joshua cannot figure it out. Joshua is asking everybody. It, it, it gets to the place where he's, he's saying, like, I, I had the plan. I, I thought I talked to God. Uh, I thought we strategized. I thought we prayed. We had the promise. Everything was going good. I thought I was supposed to prosper. I thought we were supposed to be winning. What went wrong? And the Lord told them because someone is being shady. Someone has a little fox in their heart. Someone 
didn't pray this morning. Someone, come on somebody, is still living the way they want to live. Someone is not taking the things of God seriously like they should. Someone is half-stepping. Someone is, they had a good beginning, but they don't have, they don't. And so the plan is, is he just unlayers it and unlayers it and unlayers it through casting, you know, uh, lots and all. They finally find out that it was Achan. And, you know, the sad thing for Achan is the little, little foxes didn't only take him out, but it took his whole family out. And so I know at first it seems innocent. I know at first it seems, you know, compromisable. Is that a word? I have no idea, but it is now. I know at first it seems harmless. I know it seems like it's not hurting anybody but me. At first. But just like that, that, just like that wolf that is licking on that blade, as the, as the tongue gets numb and numb, pretty soon we're regurgitating our own sinful ways. So that's why I say today, is the little foxes of our own life. Our own life. There's not one soul here today, and even online, that cannot lean into this area right here. I mean, please, my brothers and my sisters, do not ever get to a place in your walk with God where you think it cannot be you. Where you think you could, you could just ride off into the sunset now. Where you think, hey, come on, well, I've, I, 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 I know, and I've done it. Uh, I've been around. I, you know what the scariest thing for me is? Is the longer I serve God, the more familiar I get with the things of God. And whew, come on, somebody. Let's not ever get to a place in our walk with God where we think we have God all figured out, where we think we have church all figured out, where you think you have, come on, the pastor all figured out, where you think you have your husband all figured out, where you think you have, come on now, because what I've come to realize, my wife came to realize, you know, we, we, we were driving up to our house the other day and we said, oh my God, you know, just when you think you've seen it all, you realize you ain't seen nothing yet. And we just took a deep breath, <sighs> sat in the car for about a minute, and just went in the house. What were we doing? We were saying, we were just saying, oh Lord, you're little, we all got work. We all got work to do. So that's why commentaries say that we must watch our, watch our own heart. Secondly, uh, what these commentaries are also saying is, these, is the commentaries are also saying, and what Solomon is also saying, is that these little foxes of not only corruption in our own heart, but foxes of gossip. Foxes of opinions and foxes of corrupt talk. Ay, ay, ay. Again, that's all of us. Don't act like you ain't ever gossiped before. Because you would lie. Don't act like you ain't ever said something about someone. Not just even in the church. You don't lie now. We all have this little fox. Some of us just feel like we have to go around saying whatever we want. Well, I'm just 55 now, and I just have to get this off my... No, you don't. Voices? Ooh, Jesus. We'll see where this goes. I'm almost done, by the way, but... I'll throw some water on your tongue today. When we do baptisms in a, right after Easter... I'm going to baptize. I, mean, I want you to go tongue first. <laughs> then we're going to do a, one on the side. For, we're going to call it the Langwa baptisms. <laughs> I'm going to get some holy water. Pow. With some vinegar. Mm. <laughs> Lemon juice. Pow. And some of Gabriel's chili from the home. Pow. <laughs> You'll be walking around. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you ain't going to talk then. <laughs> Voices that discourage instead of encourage. Voices that tear down instead of build up. Voices that flatter in public, but their heart does not mean a word that they say. 
2 Corinthians 12.20 says, For I am afraid that when I come to you, I'm, uh, when I come to you, that you may not find me as you want to find me. And I may not find you as I want to find you. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, and arrogance, and disorder. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that, that which is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may be beneficial to those who listen. James 1.26, the message translation says, Anyone who sets themselves up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is a bunch of hot air. And only hot air. I love the message translation. There was like 42 verses I found, I found on the tongue. Those were just three. <laughs> so you want to stop an open heaven from your life? Keep gossiping. Keep slandering people. Keep talking negative. You want to, if we want to stop revival in this church, you know how to stop it? How are we going to stop? By our own mouth. We're going to stop it our own selves. God does not lean in to gossiping mouths. God does not, in and outside, I'm talking, not just talking about here, okay, but everywhere, like Facebook slanders, uh, social media slanders. Boy, I was writing something the other day on someone's, like, wall, and I was like, what am I doing, dude? Yeah, I was just about to send it, man. Oh, God. It wasn't even, it was like some random person that was talking about um, another pastor from, this is a whole other ministry. But they had a whole thread on this guy. And it was just like over 500 comments. And I just scrolled and I seen it. And I was like about to put my little two cents into it. And then I got to speak this. And the Lord quickened me and said, what? You got foxes, boy. A little fox. No one knows you. And you'll be anonymous to every one of them. But really? Is that really... You want that to spoil your vine. You want that to eat the good fruit that I have in your... You really want to lower yourself down to that thread. That's really what all this has been. Revival. William McDowell. Uh, Kim Owen. You name them. You know, God says, I've allowed that to happen to you. And here you are in one second ready to throw all that away for a comment that has nothing to do with you, has nothing whatsoever to do with your personal life. And even if it did, you should shut, this is the Lord, this is the Holy Spirit. You should just, you should, you just shut your mouth is what he told me. I'm like, oh, dang. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm telling you the honest truth. Because we all, someone say we all. We all have this little fox inside of our life. Some of us need to just be more aware of what is coming out of our mouth. Yeah. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Mark 11.23 says, Whoever shall speak to this mountain, the mountain shall be removed. So the mountain is not removed until we speak to it. But my question for us here today, what are you speaking to that mountain? What are you saying about your marriage? What are you saying about your teenager? What are you saying about your family? What are you saying about your health? What are you saying about the brother here and the sister here? What are you, come on somebody, what are you saying about God? What are you saying about people? Ooh, come on somebody. I'm tired of singing songs that we don't even believe. If I had carpet here, I'd just drop the mic. Carlos, you can start. See this guy? Look at him. He's already there. I told, I said a few weeks ago, I said, sometimes I just walk into the church, no one's here, but Carlos is right there. Ready for an altar call. What are you saying in this particular point of this, this little fox in our life? See, what we're saying 
has a lot to do. It's, it's, you want to talk about seeds being sown, our words are seeds. Let the weak say they are strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I am the head and not the tail. I will trample over snakes and scorpions. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. What are you doing? You're throwing seed. You're just throwing seed. How about this one? I'm not quitting. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to drugs. I'm not going back to alcohol. Talk to me. Because when you start declaring things, hey, there was a time over the last four years, it was the toughest time that this church has ever, was the toughest time this church has ever, ever, one of the toughest times it's ever gone through. But I had to watch what came out of my mouth. We were there in my living room with just one camera, maybe a handful, two handfuls of us trying to make it happen. There were times where I had to just speak life. I had to say things like, the church is going to make it. Our ministry is strong. Our leaders are strong. Our people are strong. Our family is strong. And there are many examples. I got them written out here, but I think I'm coming to a close here. Of people that experienced a miracle because they began to declare a thing. This is not a name it and claim it point. Okay? It's not a name it and claim it point. But what I am saying here today is that what comes out of our mouth does have the authority. You have the authority to chase darkness out of your life. You have authority. Come on, somebody, to shift an atmosphere. You and I, by claiming his word, not your opinion, not your little thoughts, not your little Bible study 10 years ago, not your little, you know, Google a scripture in five seconds stuff, but I'm talking about that word of God that is planted in your heart. I'm talking about you knowing how to declare a thing. You knowing how to speak a thing. Come on, somebody. You knowing how to stand on his word at the moment you need to stand on his word. Come on, somebody. Right, Gerald? Even when you can't, you have people around you that are speaking life over you. And what... Come on, somebody. And what the doctor said cannot happen. And when the doctors say you should make this decision. Come on, David and Becky. Hey, when the doctors say, say, you come back and say, no. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I don't speak death over my husband. I don't speak death over my marriage. I don't speak death over my family. As a matter of fact, I speak life. Come on, some of us need to start speaking life. Stop speaking death. Stop letting the devil come in. Hey. Come on, somebody. Lift up those hands all over this place and let a shout come out of your voice. Let, let something, let, speak something over your life. Don't let the darkness, don't let people that don't know God, don't let people that have no relationship with God speak into your life, speak over your life. You have what it takes. You have the authority to shift something in someone's life. Is there anybody in this place that says, I'm tired of the little foxes that are spoiling my vine. But today, come on somebody, no more happening in my life. I will watch my own heart. Not only will I watch, I will watch my own mouth. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every voice that raises itself up against me, the Lord will condemn. Lift up those hands all over this place. Lift up those hands all over this place. You're about to get a breakthrough. You, you've been looking at the big things. You've been looking for the big things. But God 
says, watch out. It's those little things. It's those little tiny things. It's those things that you leave unnoticed. It's those things that you've been compromising in. It's those things that you've been overlooking. Those are the things that are going to spoil the fruit. Lift up those hands. Let's sing a song. I will be healed. 